I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'd like to build on my previous two talks with a larger theme that will carry us pretty much through the end of this year on how do we live together? How can we live together with our families, our partners, our friends, our neighbors? How can we live together with our adversaries, political, even international? How can we take what we've learned about what helped our ancestors live together really effectively for roughly 290,000 years until agriculture began roughly 10,000 years ago. And it's been kind of Game of Thrones for most people ever since. So that's what I hope to explore with you, grounded in both the wisdom of the Buddhist tradition and modern psychology and brain science. In my previous two talks, last week I went into kind of a spacey ecstatic riff on everything is relationship, very consistent with central teachings of the Buddha. And before that, having returned from roughly a month in the mountains, camping and rock climbing um, and hiking about, uh, I really was sharing something that was very central for me about being nature, that our livingness is embedded in life, duh, in general, which has a lot, a lot of implications and in terms of how we experience things and how we make certain choices, uh, informed uh, often with the great wisdom of the first people, the native indigenous people. So I want to continue on that line, as I said, under the general heading of how do we live together, which if you live in America, my home country, and maybe if you live elsewhere in the world, it seems to be increasingly fraught and problematic and questionable on the table. How can we actually live together? And how can we even uh, live together in such a way that is grounded in the two fundamental values of compassion and justice, caring and sharing, which characterized life, social life, the living together of our ancestors, our human ancestors, as I said, for over 95% of the time that our species is, has been on this planet. Tonight, I'd like to talk about uh, the cradle of relationship in terms of the parent, infant, or young child uh, relationship and bond that we all have experienced. Not all of us have been parents. Uh, all of us have been babies. And all of us have been affected by the multi-million year history of primate, hominid, and human brain evolution, which itself has been very shaped by and aided by the growing development of the cradle of relationship. And I want to apply what science tells us now about what is effective and um, optimal in the early caregiver, infant toddler relationship that we can then apply into our lives today in terms of both how we were affected by how we were raised when we were young and what we can learn from and take from what helps things go well uh, in that cradle of relationship into our relationships with people today. This is really interesting material. My own background, you may know, is in clinical psychology, and the roots of that are developmental psychology. I've spent a lot of time with young children. I did my dissertation on 15-month-olds. I've lived the dream as a parent of two children, lived the nightmare sometimes late at night as well, walking a child up and down the hallway, uh, the beloved nightmare, no nightmare at all. So I've been down this road, and um, after I present for a bit, um, I'm going to open it up for discussion, uh, perhaps with some of you. And uh, also, I'll keep an eye on the chat sidebar to see what kind of comments uh, or insights you might offer. As usual, I ask that if you do use the chat sidebar in Zoom, 
that you do so with respect for others, uh, with presence, awareness, and kindness. And uh, I ask that you avoid advising, criticizing, or lecturing other people or selling them on something. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, it's kind of remarkable to appreciate a couple of basic facts about human biology. Fact number one is that our nearest biological relative, the chimpanzees and the bonobos, they're very close cousins, um, basically an infant, a newborn chimpanzee, has a brain that's half the size of that of an adult chimpanzee. So let's say it's a girl chimpanzee, a female. She will double the size of her brain and become fairly functional, uh, being able to, you know, move independently within months, certainly within you know a year or so of birth. A human baby, you and I, were born with a brain a quarter of the size it would eventually become. And that um, quadrupling in the size of the brain and also the development of related capabilities that humans have that chimpanzees don't have, extended the childhood of human beings. We have the longest childhood of any species on the planet. And that extension of childhood uh, over several million years, as the brain has tripled in volume in just the last several million years, that extension of childhood forced an extended period of dependency of us as little children upon our caregivers, initially dependency upon the mother. But if you see pictures of baby gorillas, they can hold on to their mothers who walks around you know, getting food and feeding them. Uh, human babies can't do that. They have to be carried, which makes their caregivers, typically their mother, uh, in you know, hunter-gatherer bands, very vulnerable. So the extension of the childhood, uh, human childhood, that enabled the growing uh, increase in the size of the brain and its development of extraordinary capabilities, the extension, the extending of that period of dependency uh, for years and years and years uh, created a vulnerability in the mother who then became more and more dependent upon her mate and by extension, more and more dependent upon the village it takes to raise a child. And so we had a co-evolution in our own species history of an increasingly large and capable brain that forced an increasingly extended childhood, in part because of a human baby were born with a brain that's half the size it would develop in adulthood, the mother would not both be able to give birth to that baby and walk upright in terms of the physical structures of the birth canal, the pelvis, and hips, and so forth. So you can see the ways in which the uh, extending of the childhood of the, of the newborn, of the, of the child, that enabled the growing size of the brain, required uh, a growing uh, development of social capabilities uh, in parents and relatives and the hunter-gatherer band as a whole, which then enabled even longer childhood and an even bigger brain in a very positive upward evolutionary spiral. The primary driver of the evolution of our own brain over the last several million years has been this socially situated process that has been um, really enabled by growing capabilities uh, and growing lovingness, broadly stated, uh, between parents and children, between parents and partners, and between uh, children, parents, partners, and the band as a whole. That's really quite extraordinary to appreciate. Just summarized in this basic fact that uh, your brain quadruples in size after you're born compared to a chimpanzee's brain who only doubles, which only doubles. Second remarkable fact, 
is that social life in every primate species, except our own, and they're ballpark 100 primate species, ish. Maybe somebody knows the exact number. They could pull it up from Wikipedia and drop it into the chat. I don't know. But among all the primate species, as the work of many scholars, and um, I think in many ways a wonderful scholar to uh, read and, and follow is Paul Gilbert, a friend of mine and colleague uh, who has the Order of the British Empire and is a, an esteemed scholar, University of Derby, I believe, spelled D-E-R-B-Y, pronounced Derby, and um, who's the founder of Compassion Focused Therapy and the Compassionate Mind Foundation. Paul is a prolific academic writer and popular writer as well. And uh, one of his central findings, pulling together a lot of material and that of other scholars, is that in every primate species, besides our own, social life, the distribution of food, the sharing or not of food, the control of who gets to reproduce, who doesn't, typically regulated through access to females, um, and other forms of social life are organized around what could be summarized as holding and controlling. It's a fundamental strategy, holding and controlling. Alphas hold resources and control others. That's how a baboon troop is organized, more or less. Uh, a group of gorillas, a group of chimpanzees, every species except our own, inside of which there is some minor sharing of food here and there. There a little bit of altruism, not very much here and there. Um, a connection between um, you know, mothers and their children, certainly. In almost all primate species except our own, the father contributes nothing to the life of his child besides a single cell. After that, kid and mom are on their own. Uniquely, the human species, based upon the build out of this extraordinary brain and its capacities for empathy, compassion, language, cooperative planning, bonding, sense of justice, feeling of loyalty, Remarkably, human groups, human hunter-gatherer bands, have a very different kind of politics, a very different organization of social life that at bottom is founded on what Paul Gilbert has called caring and sharing, or which we could recognize as compassion and justice. Certainly in hunter-gatherer bands, there can be rivalries, a certain amount of aggressiveness, even violence um, you know, between people in a band. Uh, there's some hierarchy, there are some inequalities of possessiveness, wealth, possessions, inequalities of status and, and influence and power to be sure, but they're not extreme. They're constrained uh, by the fact that uh, freeloaders in a human hunter-gatherer band can be identified, called out, and shamed. Unlike any other species in which altruism is extremely rare because freeloaders get away with stuff. If you offer a, you share your banana with a, you know, chimpanzee today, there's no sense that that chimpanzee will share with you tomorrow. And so there's no basis for altruism to evolve. In fact, altruism is um, costly for individual survival in species that don't have the social capabilities that human beings do. So in our cousins, our primate cousins, we are unique in having our social life in hunter-gatherer bands uh, on an entirely different basis, enabled by our big brains and their various capabilities as I said. That's quite extraordinary, isn't it? To think of our social life, how we live together, which is the broad, my broad theme, how we handle uh, the allocation of food, how we regulate aggressiveness, how we protect the vulnerable and the weak, how we call out shame, sometimes punish freeloaders so that they think twice the next time and altruism and cooperation have, have room in which they can, can flower. All of that is unique, essentially, to the human species. Now, there might be examples of this in the cetaceans, which are such an interesting category in their own right. 
I'm not trying to exclude them or overlook them or diminish the dolphins, the porpoises, the whales. I'm not trying to diminish on any of that. I think uh, that's, you know, these are, these are remarkable beings that we're going to learn, we continue to learn a lot more about. But certainly in terms of our primates, fellow primates, that line of evolution, uh, we stand unique. And then, factually, when agriculture came along with whatever benefits came with it, domesticating animals, forming crops, enabling surpluses of food that enabled, that enabled larger population groups, that enabled growing concentrations of wealth and power, as that occurred, the general thrust was some really interesting exceptions of early agricultural societies. But the general thrust, as populations grew in size and concentrations of wealth and power developed as well, the conditions that promoted caring and sharing in human hunter-gatherer bands, the three conditions of common truth, common welfare, and common justice, gradually eroded. Because when you have larger populations, you don't necessarily have shared truth. Of, of what's actually the case. Larger populations with concentrations of wealth and power, you, you have less and less um, shared welfare, common welfare. There's a disconnect increasingly between the fates of two-thirds, three-quarters, 98% of the population and the fates of the wealthy aristocrats who live behind their gates and guards and priests a disconnect of common welfare, and last, common justice, the conditions that promote common justice in a small band of people who live together their whole lives, more or less, most of them, 40, 50 or so people, um, some little bit of filtering in and filtering out, but essentially a pretty stable group. Um, justice there is common because your lives depend on your leaders respecting those they lead and having a sense of duty to them and making good decisions. And there are consequences if they don't. But as societies grew to thousands, tens of thousands, eventually millions, even in some cases in the world today, billions of people, leadership can easily escape the consequences of their actions. And we end up in the traditional saying, rich man's law, poor man's law, or no law at all. So uh, the point I'm making here, second point, is that our species is unique in this um, way of operating on the basis of caring and sharing. And that uh, original strategy uh, kind of was increasingly unsupported when agriculture sort of came in. And that more atavistic, primal strategy of holding and controlling became the broad basis for governance, power, privilege, um, and politics pretty much ever since. Big picture. And we see this big picture, um, <coughs> and we see the opportunities for us right today when we observe, um, you know, what Barry Brazelton, I think, called or somebody else, a good enough parent. Parents don't have to be perfect, but in the parent-child relationship that we really see developing in humans, we see the seeds of it in the behavior of you know, a mother, a gorilla mother toward her newborn. We see the seeds of it in a rat mother toward her little pups. We see the seeds of it, but we see the full complexity of the cradle of relationship uh, in um, the parent-child interaction um, really, really, really from early on. Everything I'm about to talk about, everything I'm about to talk about is available for uh, fathers, uh, available for parents who don't identify with a particular gender, available to adoptive parents. All of it is possible uh, in terms of what I'm about to talk about. So I want to name three major attributes of the cradle of relationships that are really important and really developed in human beings. They've been widely studied. There's a lot of research about what I'm talking about. There are a lot of details that I'm going to leave out here. And as I talk about this, I invite you to bring your heart into it. And what I mean by that is I invite you 
to feel in your heart about what it's like to be a little kid. Whether it's a newborn, a baby, a 10 month old, a toddler, preschooler, what is it like to be a little kid? And what was it like for you to be a little kid? The good, the bad, the neutral, the none of the above, what was that like for you? Or what can you uh, surmise or conjecture plausibly based on your childhood? Huh? And as you bring your heart into what I'm about to talk about, think about your relationships today through the lens of these three key qualities that I'm gonna now explore with you. The first of the three is availability, especially emotional availability. As a newborn who is a human newborn, completely helpless, completely de you know, dependent, it's critically important to them that their caregivers, mothers, fathers, and, and others are available rather than completely preoccupied or elsewhere or deeply depressed or drug addicted. And that they're not just physically available. It's not just that their body's in the room. They're emotionally available. They are of ready to receive the signal. The channels are not so clogged that the cries of their child cannot get through. There's emotional availability. And we can feel as adults, you know, when we're with people who are emotionally available to us, it doesn't mean that they don't have good boundaries. Emotional availability can occur with good boundaries, paradoxically. Good boundaries enables us to sustain emotional availability to others because then we don't feel we're being overrun or plundered or exhausted, you know, taken from, extracted from. Um, so it's critically important for a little kid to feel that uh, those who are significant in that child's life are emotionally available. They're ready to receive. That doesn't mean necessarily they agree from the beginning. It doesn't mean they're going to give the kid, you know, a third bucket of candy or something <laughs> after Halloween. Um, but at least they're emotionally available and they're motivated to be emotionally available and they're reliably available. So point one. Point two, they are accurately empathic. They are attuned. It's not just that they're available to receive the signal. They recognize the signal for what it is. They can get a sense of the inner life of the child. Uh, they can read between the lines. Um, one of the meanings of the word infant is without speech, without language. And for me, one of the things I really loved a lot about being with very little kids is how neat it is and challenging sometimes to really tune into them. What in the world does this nine-month-old sitting in their high chair want? Right? What in the world does this toddler who's got about four words really want? Or what's bothering them? What's going on here? You know? So little children need caregivers, broadly, who can read their signals accurately and are not continuously misinterpreting them or distorting them for their own purposes. Uh, I had very loving and decent parents, and I, I love them dearly. And the older I get, and the more that my wife and I, you know, go down the road with our adult children, the more I really appreciate my parents in all kinds of new ways. Like, wow, um, I, you know, I experience things happening with our thirty-year-olds. You know, they're in their, their early thirties, and you know, it kind of moves my needle like harum harum. And I, then I think back on how often I did worse with my own parents, who took a breath held their tongue skillfully, and kept loving me along the way. So what I'm getting at here, that said, notwithstanding that, I felt like growing up, my parents continually saw someone who was about six inches to the side of the real me. They just had a hard time. I didn't feel actually really seen or received fully or understood as all of who I was. 
I was partly the source of that, the construction of my various defenses and disengagements. And I, I swerved away from some opportunities to be more real with my parents when I was 12 or nine. But I was a kid too, you know, not so responsible for that. So however it happened though, the result was thousands of experiences of feeling incompletely seen, as if the real me was like a circle here and the perception of me was the circle there. You know, there was an overlap. It wasn't completely divergent, but it wasn't congruent. It didn't line up completely. Children need that feeling of being completely and accurately understood and seen um, by their parent. So we have first availability, accessibility, access, emotional availability in particular. Second, we have uh, empathy and attunement, rapport, right? feeling of being attuned. And then third, we have skillful responsiveness. We have some kind of response that is appropriate, skillful, and implicit in it, crucially important, is loyalty a kind of fundamental stance of being for the child. That loyalty is balanced with loyalty to other children you might have or other duties you might have, to including to your partner, including to yourself. But still, in the mix there, in skillful responsiveness, is a kind, is a kind of, like I say, being for the one you are responding to. You know, rather than being indifferent, or worse, callous or cruel. So, okay. This is the cradle of relatedness. We are um, a species that has developed uh, emotional availability and, empath and empathy and skillful responsiveness to others of our kind to an unprecedented degree among the entire animal kingdom on this planet, certainly as far as we know. And that those three qualities, perhaps there are a couple others that are crucial, but I want to certainly call out those three. Those three qualities are the cradle of relationship developmentally for us. And the um, evolution of these capabilities in our species over the last couple, three million years, especially the last half million years or so, has been the cradle of relationship broadly for us all to live together. Emotional availability, empathy, accurate empathy, and skillful responsiveness. Then I want to leave you with two questions and perhaps we can then open it up for discussion. When you look back at your own history and just seeing kind of clearly, you know, the bird's eye view, taking a lot into account, pressures on your parents, situations they were in, um, just being pretty factual about what they were dealing with, how you were raised and so forth. When you think back on your best guess or, you know, almost like embodied emotional memory for your own upbringing, what do you think was the case, roughly, in terms of emotional availability, empathy, and skillful responsiveness? And how has that affected you? And bringing to bear now some of the Buddha's beautiful practical wisdom, how has that upbringing left you, on the one hand, with wholesome, skillful, effective, beneficial qualities of mind and heart, such as perhaps secure attachment or the capacity for secure attachment or a certain bone deep sense of your own value and worth, that you're worth others being available to you. You are worth them um, making the effort to, be, to, to tune into you and, and have empathy, that you are really, that you are worth their appropriate, skillful responsive to you responsiveness to you. You might have a sense of those as useful, powerful factors. On the other hand, you might have a sense of things having been missing, as I did as a kid, to some extent, 
missing for all kinds of reasons, perhaps. And perhaps you might have a sense of wounding in addition to a lack, something missing. Um, we can be, you know, as affected by the absence of the good as by the presence of the bad. So both of those. You might reflect on that a little bit. And then how might, perhaps, whatever has was missing or wounded in terms of availability, empathy, and responsiveness, how does that fuel forms of contraction and broadly craving that create suffering and harm for you today? Which doesn't mean you should give up on not filling that hole in your heart or not healing those wounds, but it creates opportunities to look at how to address that in more skillful ways, which the Buddha has certainly taught about. And in my own work, you know, I have a large body of material about how to face challenges and to meet our needs um, on the basis of an underlying sense of fullness and balance that undermines craving rather than a, on an underlying sense of something missing and wrong. Also, to finish, when you think about your adult relationships, both and from both sides of the street, think about your primary relationship if you're married or the equivalent, long-term relationship maybe, or think about key friends. You might think about people you work for or work with or supervise or lead. Uh, you might think about your adult children if you have them. You know, what uh, would you wish for that you could name and might find ways to skillfully ask for in terms of emotional availability, empathy, and skillful responsiveness in key people? Um, I have a book coming out in January that's a lot about relationship skills and you know, have tons of access to that. It's based on a lot of material I've already taught that's freely available on my website. You know, There's a lot of material out there in other people. Uh, one of my favorite books is from Oren J. Sofer, Say What You Mean. There's lots of other good material about relationship skills to effectively do the best you can to get more of emotional availability, uh, empathy, and responsiveness in the important people in your life. Okay, turn it around, turn it around. Think about how, huh, huh, maybe it would serve some key relationships. Serve the relationship and maybe be a benefit to you really directly as enlightened self-interest for you to look at, hmm, how could I be more emotionally available here? Now, maybe to do that, I need to ask the person to not talk so loudly, you know, when they need something so I don't have to like shrink back, you know, <laughs> cover my ears, you know, metaphorically speaking. Uh, but how can I be more emotionally available, um, you know, to my friend, to my children, uh, to my partner? How could I get be a little bit better um, at empathy, at really tuning in to the feelings behind the words? the suffering behind the eyes. How could I get a little better at empathy? And skillful responsiveness. Is there a way I could be a little better at addressing their reasonable complaints or grievances or issues? Um, could I get a little faster? It's a game I play internally a lot. How can I get off it more and more quickly? And you know, if my wife or someone wants something and it kind of lands and it's not what I exactly want to do in the moment, but Within seconds, I can realize it's fine. I'll just deal with it. It's no worries, no problem. It's understandable. You know, how could you perhaps be more skillfully responsive and more quickly in a key relationship or two in a way that would serve it? Okay. And then, you know, finishing really as we imagine widening circles that can gradually include the whole human tribe, all roughly 8 billion of us right now walking this earth together together. Um, are there ways in which you could expand your imagination to become more available with an open heart, a tender heart to, to others, including those who are unlike you, uh, more interested in their lives, more empathically engaged, more open-minded and curious and in investigating what's it like to be them? And perhaps looking out on the world stage, are there ways to be more responsive? including to those who are suffering all over the world. 
that might be worth worth your consideration. I see the there, Nancy. Great. I'm going to ask you to unmute Nancy, and you have to unmute yourself. Hi. Great topic. Woo, it's home. So I'll ask you a succinct question. Probably a lot of people are thinking this. How does one heal? I mean, I was zero for three, okay? Yeah. Um, at least uh, with my mother. And it wasn't out of cruelty or neglect. It was just her own emotional turmoil. Yeah. My father was very nurturing. And so that was really helpful. But I do feel that I have been left with, um, I've been deprived of getting that sense of, you're worth it. You can, you know where I'm going. I don't yep. need to get into that. But so healing it. Um, and I've I've done a lot of work with rain and some things. Meditation has helped a lot. Mm -hmm. But if you have some other thoughts, I'd love to. Oh hear. yeah, <laughs> you came to the right place, Nancy. <laughs> so okay. So just for people in general, uh, rain is an acronym. Um, different words, you know, means different things. So essentially, to uh, recognize what you're feeling initially, especially, and then allow and accept it, investigate it, and then originally it was to not self it to kind of take a bigger view and take it less personally. Uh, Tara Brock emphasizes the N as nurture, to bring a kind of nurturance to yourself, okay. Um, <clears throat> what I think the opportunity is uh, for people who want to heal, especially early childhood wounding, and, and you know there are extremes of this that can be highly traumatic, and, and there's a lot of stuff about that. But essentially, we have the opportunity today to repeatedly internalize, uh, there's there are different terms for this, corrective emotional experiences, reparative experiences. I think of them as, um, you know, allowing ourselves to uh, experience and then take in aspects of what was missing back then. It's, you will never have had a wholly nurturing mother. And there's a grief about that, right? There's a realness. You've really worked that part. And so now I'm going to focus on the part that's about healing and refueling. That's what you've asked me for here. Yeah, yeah. And um, I encourage you to take a peek at things I've written, and in particular, the book Hardwiring Happiness, which really even gets into the neuroscience of how to, um, first of all, identify those healthy, wholesome, uh, psychological nutrients that were missing back then. I use the metaphor of the vitamin C. So you look for those experiences today. And for example, it would mean today looking for experiences with people who are indeed emotionally available, empathically attuned and skillfully responsive. They're not your mother and it's an adult-adult relationship, but they're aspects of that experience that are exactly the same as should have been present when you were two days old or you know two years old, right? And so one, it's to really look for those kind of experiences today and even go so far as to deliberately create them. I was fairly fortunate. I can think reconstructing my early childhood, when the first you know months of my life were really pretty good. My sister was born at, when I was 13 months old and things changed quickly. Uh, she had needs, okay, she's a little baby. Uh, I was a fairly quiet, well-behaved kid. Uh, so I just kind of, oh, you're fine, Rick, see you later. <laughs> you know, what, wait a minute, I'm still here. <laughs> Are you, you know? Uh, and, and then when things really went off the rails for me, uh, were older, when I was a bit older and normal experiences of feeling valued and included started disappearing, you know, didn't happen for me, including with my peers. So. Point being, when I started doing this work myself with a gust, with gusto, by the time I was in my late twenties, I would sometimes deliberately try to create the key experiences that I that I was missing. So, for example, I'll confess, uh, and I became a little no notorious for for this among my friend network. Um, a friend might say to me something like, "That was good what you said in the meeting, Rick," or, "You know, I liked, I liked." going for that walk with you. And I would say, huh, I hope you don't mind. What did you like about what I said? 
<laughs> so yeah, I was fishing, you know, a little bit. And yet I knew what I was doing. I wasn't, you know, I was trying to fill myself. I was trying to bring in an experience and then take it into myself. Not so that I was endlessly dependent on that external supply, uh, but that actually I was trying to heal and resupply and supply something inside that had been missing, right? So, okay, key is as an adult today to look for opportunities to have experiences that bring you the psychological nutrients and sometimes bring the soothing and repair that was missing when you were little. And then critically important, neurologically speaking, take in the good. Slow it down for a breath or longer to marinate in that experience. And it becomes really quite interesting. If, if those early experiences were missing, it can sometimes seem hard to actually make room for them in your mind today. Or I think of it as compliments kind of, or you know, really yeah. them, take them in. Yeah. Yeah. And um exactly right. So you want to you help yourself. The most important thing here, Nancy, is to be on your own side about this and to have uh, confidence and courage that you can do this over the next year or two or three. You can make a radical change in that basement of your own psyche and bring in experiences um, and help them really sink in even down into younger parts of yourself or younger hurting places inside. And I really go into depth in this, how to do this, including linking current positive experiences to young hurting places uh, in that book, Hardwiring Happiness, which I would, I would really encourage you to check into. I, I certainly will. Yeah. And then the last thing I'll just say for everybody is it's... It's really important that the healing experience um, include a developmental matching to the places that were lacking or wounded. So what I mean by that is that if a friend today pays you a compliment, like, oh, what a nice haircut you have. That's nice. But it may be that you can get a sense of that as a sort of appreciating of you. That's not about your haircut, but it's a but it's a more general, visceral, tender, somatic appreciating of you that would be the kind that would be appropriate for a three-year-old or even a three-day-old. So it's the idea of helping what's coming into us sink down into and touch the tip of the root of suffering deep down inside. And, and then do the work to do that. Therapy is, you know, psychotherapy often draws on these skills. I did not invent these approaches, but I've really tried to summarize them ground and ground them in brain science and really apply them, um, right? So they're, they're, okay. not, they're not woo-woo, they're- I understand. Do you feel that that changes your brain? Yeah, there's a lot, yeah. Because, and the evidence for changing your brain, and then I'm gonna move on to, the, to, oh boy, to Naomi and Glenda. I don't think, Susan, I'm gonna be able to get to you because we're gonna, I'm gonna try to end pretty soon here. Um, if your mind changes, your brain must be changed. So if you feel like there's a shift inside, in my experience, I don't know anyone. Um, let me say that differently. Almost everyone I've ever known who's applied these methods at the level of five to 10 minutes a day within days starts noticing a difference and within months starts feeling really different. In the rare exceptions when that isn't the case, you should then look to something else such as clinical depression that's underlying and is just obstructing the um, emotional learning that I'm talking about here. All right. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Yeah, there's no study I know that's exactly on this particular approach. There are growing studies about brain change during psychotherapy, but, um, and I think that they're great, but the most fundamental evidence for change of the brain is change of the mind. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much, Nancy, for bringing that up. Yeah, best to you, really. Okay, Naomi, I'm asking you to unmute. Great question that's related to what we've been talking about. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, wonderful. It's great to be here. Thank you. I'll yeah. make it very short and to the point. I know that in a, ma a matter of man and woman, one couple, uh, and that's advice I always gave to my siblings, everybody always looks to me for advice, is that we always 
turn to the other person, expecting him to supply us with the needs that were missing when we were growing up. And I think that, I don't know, I'm not a psychiatrist, psychologist or psychiatrist, but I think that's kind of the root of the problem, that we don't get what we need or want from our spouses because we don't tell them. We don't know ourselves what exactly it might be. So that's the preamble to what I'm asking. The question is this, I'm a widow and I recently was seeing someone and uh, and I really didn't feel that I was getting any feedback, but it was good to know that I was doing good. But then all of a sudden, uh, it, it, it like blew apart and I got nothing at all. And, and I still felt that I needed to do. And then I felt I'm, 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 I shouldn't be doing it. It should be, I should be getting some kind of, you know, uh, yeah. satisfaction from the relationship. And I was getting none. Um, and so fact, what's the question? So how do we deal with something that we, <laughs> we know it's not good for us and we still keep at it. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, as a person pounding themselves on the hammer, why is my hand hurting? What's why is my hand hurting? I don't know. It's a mystery. Okay. So I'm going to cut to the chase here because then I also want to be able to finish up and get to Glenda as well on the way. So um, uh, sometimes we're just unlucky. S somebody looks good and they don't turn out to be good. And, you know, we just got unlucky. We didn't see it. Uh, no reasonable person could have seen it. We were just unlucky. And I think it's useful to not overinterpret. On the other hand, if there's one problematic relationship after another, a good question is, gee, what's the common factor in all of them? Uh, uh, you know, it's me. So that, that's part one. Part two, I think that it's um, really important to be aware of the repetition subtly of patterns that, of relationship that we learned from childhood and or that were culturally, including ones that were culturally imposed upon us and to kind of push against those scripts and to really ask ourselves, even looking for a romantic relationship, you know, in midlife or beyond, um, what, you know, to challenge what we think we deserve and to be real clear about what actually is what we're looking for and the basis for a good, healthy relationship. And um, in, in my view, I could do a whole talk on dating and mating. I think I probably should at some point. I might stick my neck out, but for me, it really boils down effective dating and mating broadly. I mean, mating relationally, not so much sexually. Um, dating and mating uh, is basically clear intention, and most many, many people who want a partner do not have clear intentions. They're ambivalent or inner conflict, they're unconscious dynamics, or they, they feel inhibited about letting themselves want what they really want. Clear intention, including putting it out into the universe. Uh, second, all the skills of psychology. Of, you know, how do you meet people? How do you talk? How do you resolve issues? How do you get to the other side of your first fight? How do you quickly discern that you're with someone who's a charming jerk? Uh, you know, how do you put out your own needs, psychology? And the third aspect is marketing. <laughs> because if you're looking for someone pretty special, you need some deal flow. <laughs> <laughs> you need a lot of people to go through that. So I think that's that's really important in terms of finding people that are that are good and worthy for who you really are. And then you make decisions. Sometimes uh, relationships uh, in midlife, the second half of the lifespan and beyond, uh, they don't fit the you know romantic ideal necessarily, and yet they're good enough. Maybe you spend the night with each other once a week, and that's great. Otherwise, you kind of do separate things, or you you do certain kinds of travel together, or vacation together. Or you have different kinds of relationship, and it feels fine, you know, for adults who have, you know, histories and lives of their own. Anyway, that's just my two cents there. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much, Naomi, for sticking your neck out. Um, definitely, just tuning into you, a little bit of empathy on the fly here. They got to be somebody who uh, can laugh, and and. I also someone who can make you laugh. I can see that that's a really central feature too. You bet. Well deserved. Okay, Glenda, bring us home. Glenda, I'm asking you to unmute. Oh, that's pretty special to be talking to you, Dr. Rick. Um, Pleasure so too. A kiwi. 
Yeah, kiwi, flightless bird. Um, so to keep it as brief as I can, my siblings have been incredibly important in my life. First thousand days um, gave me the security that I needed um, to go out into life very independently because my parents were very violent. And um, mm. so I've kind of gone through my psychological growth in my own journey. I didn't really, I had a very, very violent childhood once my children, once my siblings had left. Uh, so, yeah. You were um, no longer protected. No, no, no. And it, it was it was quite horrendous. But yeah. the um, cradle of relationship, the youngest of my sisters, who was very significant in my life and has been, is now very, um, well, politically, we're completely opposed. Yeah. And it's becoming, when you talk about, you know, the um, holding and controlling versus caring and sharing, the change in this very um, compassionate person, yeah. uh, and I will say who has a very deep religious belief, oh, um, yeah. is so difficult for me to process because it, it's kind of the fundamental of where I was well enough to become independent, you know? I mean, and I wonder if you can advise me in that dynamic, yeah. what's, where so, do I go with that kind of healing, trying to find, as you were giving us those yeah. um, bills, which one and how? Right. Well, uh, you're naming a topic that I do hope to gradually get to, which is, um, you know, what do we do in an increasingly politically polarized world. And I also want to name it that very often that polarization is one-sided. It's that the center has more or less remained, but wow, the right has really moved toward authoritarianism, often with um, an infusion of, of evangelical religiosity and racism. So what do we do just to name the fact of it, just to name it? And obviously there are critiques of the left and so forth, but the polarization is really, it's been asymmetrical as many, many people have observed, including scholars over the last 40 years. So in any case, what to do about it, that's a huge thing. And as we finish up here, two things strike me, you know, all well, three really, including, is this your good person? Um, one is when you think about going back to key themes in your childhood, being unprotected. And so looking for protection and the internalization of others who are protective and being able to give yourself protection today that was um, unavailable to you as a child, understandably, when you were young. And so I'm calling out a potential key nutrient. We'll call it your vitamin P, <laughs> P for protection. But I just I'm, I'm just hearing that in your story. And by the way, the way I'm being here is is I think it's 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 skillful to ask oneself what are key experiences. As I named for myself, um, uh, a feeling of someone who really loved me that was present for me as a child. But the feeling of being seen for who I was, and in group and group settings with other peers, being wanted and included and valued that was missing for me. So those became really important psychological nutrients, particular vitamins in a sense, to look for as an adult to have experiences of that I could then internalize and gradually hardwire into my own brain. Okay, so you see this process here? So I'm calling out one thing I hear in your story, there may be more, but that sense of protection. So then we have the, the sibling who was really important to you obviously, and there's history. Uh, the longest relationships we tend to have in this life are with our siblings. This is really interesting. Yeah, yeah longer than with our children. I heard our... it from you, actually. Oh, okay, yeah, and I heard it from my professor of developmental psychology at, uh, back in the day. Uh, so what do we do about that? One of the things that, that has worked for me is to resize relationships the scope of them, and which can include just staying out of certain conversational topics, just not going into certain topics or being a little bit, I think about helium, argon, I think they're called noble gases because they do not form compounds. <laughs> they're so noble. <laughs> they're always isolated. But in any case, to be like the noble gas, so they're saying their things and you're thinking, oh, wow, do I so want to respond? But you just let it go on by. 
and then you talk about the apple pie you're making together or how the cousins are doing, your children, or whatever else might, you know, how's New Zealand doing in the World Cup? I don't know. All black, I'm a fan, uh, you know, rugby team. And so, um, you know, that's part one is just resizing it. That can be really helpful. And part two is to see the being behind the eyes. It's where you realize, you know, behind those those politics that just you can hardly you can't you can't understand it. But behind that belief about a whole bunch of facts that you just know are not true, whatever. Behind all that, there's a being over there. And even if you don't like the politics, you can love the being. Or you can even love the young core of that being who was your precious sister when you were growing up. And what you do, what you can do is you just can kind of rest in a sense of that which you can feel kind toward and caring about and, uh, you know, loving in effect um, while not being um, hijacked by or preoccupied with all the words and positions and stuff around it. And that for me has been a really useful practice with many, many people, uh, you know, including my own mom, who had a big personality, and I just kind of learned to look past it to the, 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 the warmth uh, that, that always loved me. Wow. Well, thank you. I, that's wonderful advice, and I'll try all of those things. Well, that's great. It'll be good for you, and it'll be good for them, too. Okay, so I went long. I hope this was uh, useful for you. Uh, quick recap, um, cradle of relationship is emotional availability, empathy, and skillful responsiveness. And how can we learn from that in our dealings with each other? So we'll continue these topics uh, in the weeks to come, and I encourage you to, to keep coming back. You might want to bring more people with you, and this is a series of talks that I think could be helpful for various people you know. You can just let them know how to participate in these meetings and send them the link and they can be part of it. Um, and I'll keep on going under the general heading of how do we live together? <laughs>